Okay, so we're on to chapter four now, the last chapter of the semester on <coughs> sequences and series. Uh, so let's start off with sequences. Okay, a sequence is actually nothing but a function, really. Um, it's just a function whose domain is different than the functions we've been looking at so far. Its domain is going to be the natural numbers. Okay, so that's how we're going to define a sequence. A sequence is a function. whose domain is the natural numbers. Right, and we typically would write it this way. So you could write it as, okay, the general term is Sn, n going from 1 to infinity, right? And then you get this sort of list. S1, S2, S3, and it keeps going. Okay, or uh, if you're lucky, you have a formula for the general term. So you might have something like Sn equals minus 1 to the nth power. Okay. And typically what we really care about with sequences is what happens when n gets large. So a lot of the time, eh, it, you don't really care so much what happens when n is 1 or 2 or 3, but what happens as n goes to infinity, uh, does the sequence do anything interesting? Uh, so say usually we care what happens when n is large. And a typical example where you might see a sequence like this, and where, again, you don't really care what S1 is or what S2 is or whatever, but you care what happens when n is large, is maybe you have a sequence that was generated by using Newton's method to sol try to solve an equation. All right, so you'd have a sequence generated like this, where you start with some initial term, and then you use that to generate a new thing. Then you use your next term to generate a new thing. And again, OK, x1 is relevant because it's used to kick off the sequence. But you don't care so much what x1 is. You don't care so much what x2 is. But you hope that after you've done several iterations of this, uh, this sequence is these values of x are getting close to a value that will actually solve your equation, right? So we care what happens when n is large. So this is what our hope is would be here. So we hope that if n is large, that xn is close to some x star uh, where f at x star is 0. OK, so there's a little bit of motivation for why we want to study sequences. Because actually, if you're doing applied math, computational math, you're going to see sequences a lot. And you're going to care a lot what these sequences do. And you know, typically, we're not going to have a simple expression like this where we can just know exactly what the value is when n is large. We need to do, we'll have something like this or something more complicated than this. And we need to do some analysis to figure out what's actually going on here. Is this going to actually compute the thing I want it to compute, or is it going to do something else? OK, so of course, what we're interested in, as I said, we care what happens when n is large. We hope as, as n is large that xn gets close to this x star. Um, in other words, we're hoping that this thing converges to a limit. So we can define a limit uh, exactly the same way we've defined limits before, right? This is nothing but a function that we're hoping converges. We already know things about limits of functions. Uh, and now what we're taking is not x going to x naught, but n going to infinity. And okay, we know how to define limits as n goes to infinity. We've done this before for functions. So we're going to say that a sequence converges to a limit. <coughs> 
call it s, if. OK, and you already know the definition, right? For every epsilon greater than 0, so that's our tolerance. And what do we want? We're, again, we're not taking x to x0. We're taking n to infinity. So that means that there should be some value of n large enough that if we stay larger than that, we get within our tolerance. So there should exist some n, call it capital N, such that as long as we're bigger than this value of n, then Sn minus S stays less than epsilon. Right? And then we write the usual thing that the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn is equal to S. Okay, that's, you know, that's not new. We're putting different labels on things. It's not F and it's not X anymore. It's S and it's N. But it's exactly the same definition that we've used before. Okay, and a sequence can either converge or not. If it doesn't converge, then we say it diverges. So it's this sequence that doesn't converge. is going to diverge. Right, and diverge could mean it diverges off to infinity, or it just bounces around and never settles down anywhere, or whatever. OK, so easy example. And you know how to do this already. If I take Sn equals 1 plus 1 over 2 to the n, and we want to show that there's a limit. So now for these sequences, whenever we're taking a limit, we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. And we want to show it's equal to 1. OK, and again, you know how to do these problems, right? We pick our epsilon. Okay, we know that we need to look at Sn minus 1 and try to make it small, try to make it less than our tolerance. So we look at Sn minus 1, and we say that's nothing but 1 over 2 to the n. And we want to try to make that less than epsilon. So we say, can we make this less than epsilon? It's going to be less than epsilon if. Okay. And what do we want? If 2 to the n is bigger than uh, 1 over epsilon. And then we do what we always do, right? We try to solve for the n that we need in order to pull this off. Uh, so for this, we're going to take a log base 2. So this happens if we take log base 2 n is greater than log base 2 of 1 over epsilon. So this we're going to call our capital N. All right, and then you're done. Then you say, great, we've satisfied the definition of the limit. We found an N that makes this work. It ensures that as long as we're past this point, again, S1 could be really different. S2 could be really different as long as we're past this point. We stay within epsilon, within our tolerance of 1. So we can say, great, indeed, the limit of this thing is equal to 1. OK, we're happy with this. We can do these problems, right? Uh, I'll give you another one that's a little more complicated. Sn equals n squared plus 2n divided by n cubed minus 5. And we want to show that the limit of this is equal to 0. <clears throat> OK, um, we're going to, again, start the same way that we always do. We need an epsilon. 
Okay, and now uh, what I'm going to suggest as a rule of thumb for these problems, the behavior of these things is going to be determined by the highest power of n in the numerator and the denominator. So we want to put, get estimates that put the numerator just in terms of n squared terms and estimates that put the denominator just in terms of n cubed terms. That's your rule of thumb. Okay, so we also know that we're going to be taking this minus 0. So we want n squared plus 2n less than something that looks like n squared. And we want the denominator greater than something that looks like n cubed. This is rule of thumb. Now we're going to do it precisely. Um, so again, we can take advantage of the fact that we don't care what happens when n is large. Right? This is analogous to saying before, we can assume delta is less than 1. Right? I can assume capital N is bigger than 1 or bigger than 5 or whatever I need it to be bigger than. So we're going to do that. So we're going to say, first of all, if n happens to be bigger than or equal to 2, then 2n is certainly less than or equal to n squared. Yes? Right, all I've done is actually multiply both sides of this by n. Okay, and if 2n is less than or equal to n squared, that means that n squared plus 2n is less than or equal to n squared plus n squared. That's 2n squared. Right, so I know that my numerator is going to be bounded by 2n squared. Right? It's, okay, not for the first term, but once I hit the second term and beyond, that's always true. So I can use this as a fair estimate. Okay, I want to do the same kind of trick with my denominator. Um, I want an inequality that's going the other way around. So for the denominator, we'd like to say something like n cubed minus 5 is bigger than or equal to something. And we'd like to have it in terms of n cubed. So I'm going to leave a little space here. OK, as I've written it now, I can't make that work, right? Um, but say, let's try to just put a constant in front of this. Okay? As long as it scales like n cubed, I'm kind of happy. I expect to get behavior that looks like n cubed. So maybe we can try to do this. Again, this is something I haven't proved yet that this works. I'm just saying life would be nice if I could do something like this. Because then instead of having a complicated sort of polynomial in here, I would just have an n cubed term, have an n squared on top, and now I can start canceling things. Okay, so I'm saying we'd like to say this, and we're going to do some work and find out if we can say it once n is big enough. Um, we don't even have to maybe do by induction. So let's try something even simpler. So this will hold if I rearrange things a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to bring all the n cubes together. If, so this holds if and only if half n cubed is greater than or equal to 5. Which holds if and only if n cubed is greater than or equal to 10. Right, so this holds if and only if n is bigger than or equal to the cube root of 10, right? Um, which, again, will work as long as n is bigger than or equal to 3, because we're working with whole numbers. OK, so again, we can say, all right, this isn't going to work for n equals 1. This isn't going to work for n equals 2. but we can say, as long as, as long as n is bigger than or equal to 3, we're going to have n cubed minus 5 bigger than or equal to 1 half n cubed. Right? And I argued this because right, I know I'm trying to get this in terms of the leading order term here. I know I might like to make this whole thing less than or equal to something, which means I need to make the denominator less than something. 
and the, sorry, the numerator less than something, the denominator bigger than something. So I knew which direction I was trying to argue. And, and then I just guessed at a number here. And I didn't have to put a half here. I could have put a third or a fifth or whatever. I just picked something that's easy to work with. Okay. So if we put this all together, as long as n is bigger than or equal to 3, we're going to have that Sn minus 0 is okay, n squared plus 2n over n cubed minus 5. And I'm not going to even need the absolute value signs here, because n is big enough that these will all be positive terms. And now we know that the top is less than n squared. And we know that the bottom is bigger than half n cubed. <coughs> uh, 2n squared, I guess. Sorry. OK, and now this simplifies a lot. This is just 4 over n. Right? Oh, so you know, taking this and saying this less than epsilon and solving for n, uh, that's sort of complicated to say if that's always going to work, because now you've got a complicated polynomial to solve. And it might come up and come back down. It's hard to say. This, this is easy to work with. Now I say, I know I want to make this less than epsilon. Can I do it? And the answer is, sure, I can, as long as I take n to be bigger than 4 over epsilon. And this, becomes, this becomes my capital N. OK, so again, we conclude we've done it, right? We picked our tolerance, epsilon. Um, oh, actually, this doesn't quite become our capital N. We should take capital N to be the maximum of that in 3, actually, to be really precise. So we'll say that. Take capital N to be the maximum of 3 and 4 over epsilon, right? This is the same game we played before with our deltas when we said we're assuming delta is less than 1, and then we find other conditions on delta. And then we've done it and conclude that, indeed, the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence is 0. <coughs> Questions there? the same kind of techniques we've used before for functions, just with different labels. Um, and the usual results uh, on limits hold, right? Adding limits, subtracting limits, multiplying limits, multiplying by scalar constants, things like that. I'm not going to go reprove all of those because the proofs are the same. OK, then what we want to learn about is convergence sequences. We want to learn properties of convergence sequences. Um, and even better, how do we? decide if a sequence is convergent without having to know explicitly what the numbers are in it. OK, so first of all, we'll talk about bounded sequences. A sequence Sn is bounded above uh, if there exists some real number such that Sn is less than or equal to b for all n. This is our usual definition of bounded above. <coughs> okay, um, we can have a sequence bounded below. Okay, so it's bounded below if we do the same thing, but this time we stick the bound below it. So if, again, there exists some number such the sequence always stays above that number. Yeah. Since all our limit rules hold for before, yep. if we were evaluating that, could we do it as like sums and like sums of limits? And uh, as long as sure. As long, so as long as your component limits yeah. all exist. Cool. Yes. So you can use whatever tricks we know. Breaking limits up, factoring, 
whatever looks easiest. Yeah, for many of these problems, right, there's not one right answer. There's many right approaches, and you do whatever looks easiest to you. Okay, and then a sequence is bounded if it's bounded both above and below. Okay, so one result we have uh, is that if you have a sequence and it happens to be convergent and has a limit, you can automatically say that the sequence is bounded. Now, this is not true for general functions, right? General function we could become unbounded and then we, you know, it could look like 1 over x and then we plug the hole with some other value and let it do something else and then it might still have a limit at infinity. For a sequence, a sequence only hits discrete values. And this is going to actually be enough to force it to stay bounded if it converges. Okay? So a uh, convergent sequence is automatically bounded. <coughs> With the flip side of that being, if I hand you a sequence and you happen to notice it's an unbounded sequence, you automatically know there's no limit. So if we want to prove this, we're going to say, let's suppose we start with a convergent sequence. So something that has a limit. Okay, and we want to try to construct a bound on these terms. What's the biggest these Sn could possibly be? And I'm going to use the fact that, you know, I give you any tolerance I like. As long as n is big enough, it's going to stay close to the limit, right? It's not going to exceed it by more than my tolerance. So we're going to then have two things to compare. We're going to have the sequence after this capital N, what it does, and it's going to stay close to the limit, and then the sequence before the capital N, and it's going to hit. There's only finitely many values it's going to hit. So let's just pick a tolerance. Let's pick epsilon equals 1, just because we can. OK, we know there exists some capital N such that if little n is bigger than capital N, then Sn minus S is less than 1. That was my epsilon. Okay, so if I write Sn itself, Sn is Sn minus S plus S. Do triangle inequality. And we know this term, right? I don't know exactly what Sn is, but it's within a distance 1 of s. And s is just some fixed number. So as long as we're far enough along the sequence, this is going to hold. Okay, so for big values of n, we've got a bound. Now we just have to combine that with whatever uh, the sequence does for small values of n. So I'm going to say let's let m equal the maximum of all of these things, of s1, uh, s2, all the way up to s capital N. So we know if sn is small, um, it's going to be equal to one of these values, right? It's going to be less than the maximum of all these values. And we know if Sn is big, it's going to be less than this. So I'll throw this in. 
Okay, here we have a maximum, right? Because there's only finitely many things in here, and one of them is bigger than the rest. Right? This is where this wouldn't work for general functions, right? If I say, let's take the maximum of f on some domain from 0 to infinity or whatever, well, the maximum might not exist. Here, the maximum definitely exists. So this is a well-defined number. It's a real number. And we can say that Sn is always less than or equal to m. Right? Because if, if n is small, it's going to be equal to one of these terms and less than the maximum of them all. And if n is big, it's going to be less than this. So we can say, great, Sn is a bounded sequence. Make sense? Any questions on that? OK, what about the converse of this? So if a sequence is convergence, it's bounded. Uh, if it's a sequence is bounded, what can we conclude? Nothing in general, exactly, right? We know we can have a sequence, for example, that just bounces between plus and minus 1 and doesn't converge. It's bounded, but it doesn't converge. Um, but there's a special exception to this rule if you happen to have a sequence that's monotonic. So if you have a sequence that's always going up and it stays bounded, it converges. If it's always going down, but it stays bounded, it's not allowed to drop down to a minus infinity, it converges. So this is a special exception to the rule. Uh, OK, so a monotonic bounded sequence converges. OK, so I'm going to do the proof, assuming that we have a sequence that's always going up. But the proof will work the same way if the sequence is always going down. So let's assume that Sn is always going up, so it's non-decreasing. And it's bounded. <coughs> Now what I want to do is write down a candidate for the limit. Yeah. Yes. Right. So I needed a way to get a bound on this. Uh, I happened to know that I have a bound on this term. Right, because I just wrote down what it meant for this thing to be convergent. So I knew that it would be convenient to have an Sn minus S right. because I could bound it. If I do that, obviously I have to add the S back in again. Okay. And again, S is just some fixed number. You needed to isolate that term by itself. I needed to isolate this term by itself, yeah. OK, so here I have a sequence that's non-decreasing. It's going up or staying the same. And it's bounded. Uh, I want to come up with a candidate for my limit. Um, so what's a good candidate for the limit? The bound. The bound, yeah. So in particular, of course, the, the, least, bound. the least upper bound. Exactly, right? There's many bounds. So exactly. So what I'm going to do is write this in terms of things that we've used before. I'm going to let s equal the set of all Sn. Uh, let me use a script s here. OK, um, so we've got a set, right? Um, it's the subset of the real numbers. These have some values. It's bounded. We know it's bounded. And since it's bounded, it has a least upper bound. It has a supremum. So we're going to say the supremum of all of this is some real number. And this is my candidate for the limit, right? Because since we know our sequence is going up, going up, going up, going up, 
we should expect it to get arbitrarily close to its least upper bound. Intuitively, this makes sense. We'll do a little more work to try to prove it. So our goal is going to be able to sh is going to be to show that this is actually the limit. Okay, so if that's my goal, my next line should be to pick an epsilon. Right? Again, this is like a hint for the test. The first line is always pick an epsilon and make sure it's positive. Okay, so we're going to take our sequence and compare it to s minus epsilon and to compare it to s plus epsilon. Okay, so how does this compare to s minus epsilon? Well, we know that s minus epsilon is not an upper bound for this sequence, right? Right? Because we said s, s is the smallest possible upper bound we could ever find. s minus epsilon is less than that which means it's no longer an upper bound. So s minus epsilon is not an upper bound for my sequence. It can't be because this is the smallest possible upper bound and this guy's even smaller than s. Okay, so we'll say since s minus epsilon is less than s, Okay, that means there exists some value of n such that Sn is bigger than S minus epsilon. Right? If S minus epsilon is not an upper bound, that means at some point the sequence climbs above it. Right? It might be just one point, it might be many points, we don't know, but at some point it climbs above this. Okay, now if we had a general sequence, it could climb above this point, but then drop below it again and maybe try to converge to some other value or maybe try to not converge to anything. But exactly, we have this extra bit of information that our sequence is not allowed to go down from here. It's allowed to stay the same, it's allowed to go up. It's not allowed to go down. So we're going to say since Sn is non-decreasing, That implies that Sn is bigger than or equal to S capital N whenever N is bigger than capital N. It stays within an epsilon neighborhood of S, right? At least from one direction, right? Uh, we should also compare to S plus epsilon. What can we say about S plus epsilon? It's bigger than all values. So S plus epsilon is an upper bound, right? If S is an upper bound, then anything bigger than S is also an upper bound. Okay? So since S plus epsilon is bigger than S, S plus epsilon is an upper bound. That means all values of our sequence are going to be less than S plus epsilon. And in particular, these later values of our sequence are going to satisfy this bound. So we put this all together and we say as long as N is bigger than capital N, we have that 
S minus epsilon is less than Sn. That's this top line here. And Sn is less than S plus epsilon. And that's what we want. That's what that's saying is, is that, OK, again, we don't know what happens to our sequence initially. But once we hit a certain tolerance, once we hit capital N, beyond that, the sequence always stays within this epsilon distance of the number s. So that means that, in particular, Sn minus s is less than epsilon whenever n is bigger than capital N. That's the proof. That's the definition of convergence, right? What we always do, we say we're trying to, I had a goal. It's always good to start with a goal. And the goal means, if my goal is to prove something's a limit, that really means my goal is to write down the definition of the limit. So I've written down the definition, chose any epsilon greater than 0, and I found there exists a capital N. We construct it along here, such that we can stay within epsilon of our candidate limit. So indeed, limit as n goes to infinity of Sn equals s, and Sn is convergent. Any other questions on the proof of this? Yeah. So like, let's say the function was, the sequence was monotonic. Yes. Only for a finite amount of points in the beginning. OK. And then it eventually Great question. Yes. So we have a sequence that initially it does wild things. It bounces around. But then at some point, it becomes monotonic. This so proof will still work. So indeed, for sequences, when we're talking about convergence, it never matters what the sequence does initially. It only matters that after a certain point, it starts to behave itself. So yes, if you can show that um, after, for n bigger than 10, for example, the sequence is monotonic and the sequence is bounded, then you have a convergent sequence. Absolutely. Yeah. For any sequence SM, if you shift the index by 1, they yeah. both converge to the same value, right? Um, so if, if you so if you have a convergent sequence and you shift the se and you shift the sequence by one, so my first sequence was, you know, one one half one third one quarter or whatever, and my second sequence and started starting at one, I start at a half a third a quarter. Yes, they're both going to converge to the same value. So you can always just like shift out the bad part. Ex that's exactly what you can do. That's exactly how you prove that is you shift you define a new sequence that started at S10 for example S11. You say my new sequence satisfies my conditions, it's monotonic everywhere, it's bounded, it has a limit, then my old sequence has a limit too. Okay, so let's use this. Let's uh, define a sequence, Sn by, okay, I'm going to do something where I can't write down explicitly what these terms are. It's something that's just generated <coughs> using some iterative procedure. Which again, in, in real life, is what you usually see. If you actually have a nice, clean form of the sequence, then there's usually easier ways to prove this, there's a limit, because we know tons about limits. Um, but let's try to say that this is convergent. OK, we're going to have a few techniques that we uh, will learn along the way for deciding if a sequence is convergent. But my hint right now is let's use the one that we just proved. Uh, we'll come up with a list at the end of what techniques we have and when they're kind of useful to use. Um, we want to check two things. We want to check if this is bounded. And we want to check if this is monotonic. So first, part one, 
is to say, is this sequence bounded? You think no? Well, let's play with this a little bit. So I'm going to claim it is bounded, in fact. Um, and one way, you know, if you're playing with this and you're not sure what bounds to try, of course, the first thing you do is plug in a few values and just see what the sequence does. That proves nothing, but it gives you an idea what the sequence is doing uh, to guess at what might be reasonable. So I'm going to try to make this claim. I'm going to claim that the values of Sn always live between 1 and 2. Okay, And again, I will have done that by just plugging in a few values and seeing what the sequence looks like. It looks like it's doing, looks like it never wants to get bigger than 2, so let's try it. Uh, how would you prove a claim like this? Inductively, right? So I have something that I want to prove is true for all natural numbers. So proof by induction is your go-to technique here. So let's try to prove via mathematical induction. OK, so we know there's two parts. There's a base step, and there's an induction step. So our base step says we should look at S1. S1 is 1, and that indeed lives between 1 and 2. So that's good. Okay, now we're going to do our induction step. So for our induction step, we're going to start it the way we always do, we're going to suppose SK lives between 1 and 2. And we want to try to look at SK plus 1 and show that it's forced to also stay between 1 and 2. right? And that'll mean that 1 is, lives in that interval, that forces S2 to live in that interval. S2 lives in there, it forces S3 to live in there, and so on. They just keep staying in there. OK, so let's write down SK plus 1 and see what we can do with it. All right, we need to bound this in two directions, right, above and below. OK, so let's start by going this direction. SK we assume to be bigger than or equal to 1. So I can put that in here. And that direction works, right? This is bigger than 1. OK, then I go the other direction. SK plus 1 uh, is, again, root 1 plus SK. Okay. Now we've made the assumption that SK is at most 2. So this is at most square root of 3. Square root of 3 is less than the square root of 4. So this is certainly less than 2. Right? And that's actually it. We've shown that, indeed, SK plus 1 lives now in this interval. And that means they all do. So we can conclude SK always, or SN always lives in 1, 2 for all values of n. And in particular, if the sequence is stuck in this finite interval, the sequence is bounded, right? That's what, that's what it means for it to be bounded, that I can pick a lower bound and an upper bound and say the sequence is stuck between those values. So Sn is bounded. This wasn't a 
recursively yes. It would be this easy. If it wasn't recursively defined, it wouldn't be this easy. Um, it has to, I mean, the sequence you're looking at is defined somehow. And very frequently, they are going to be recursively defined. Not necessarily through a formula that's as simple as this one. This is a simple formula, right? But if you think of Newton's method, for example, that's a recursive formula. Um, and OK, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking of this from the perspective of a numerical analyst, where almost everything I do involves, we write down an iteration, and you really hope that it converges to the thing you want, but it might not. Um, but typically, you have these recursive formulas. Um, and you may need more complicated properties, some more complicated mathematics sometimes to pull out these results. But the idea is the techniques are these. If it's not recursively defined, if you just have a straight out formula, you know, Sn is equal to 1 over 2 to the n, OK, we know how to yeah. handle limits like that. OK, so it's bounded then we also need to show that it's monotonic. Didn't we use that to bound it? We didn't use it to bound it, but it's kind of it's in there. It's not. So we picked the endpoints. Yeah, we picked the, essentially we picked the endpoints. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not hard to pull out, as you've already observed. It's going to be like a one-liner, basically. Uh, but we should write it down. So the claim is that Sn is <coughs> right. So I picked the endpoints. I guess what I didn't do is say that uh, Sk plus 1 is bigger than Sk. Right? And that's what I really needed for monotonic. Not just, that, not just that the right-hand side is some monotone function, but that it gives me a new bigger value. So, it, but indeed, it's not that complicated to show in this case. So my claim is going to be that Sn is increasing. Um, so the problem with taking a derivative here is that I have a function only of natural numbers. Um, but that would be one approach, yeah, to say if we can extend this to a real value fu to a function on R, take the derivative, that would be one approach. Um, and, and, and it would be a valid approach. Okay, so here I'm going to do the same thing that I did before and use induction. So my base case is I have to start by comparing the first two values. So S1 equals 1, S2 is root 2, and indeed it's going up. Okay, my induction step, I'm going to suppose that sk plus 1 is bigger than or equal to sk. And now I'm going to have a line, another line that looks basically exactly like these lines here. So we suppose it holds for n equals k. Now we need to show it works when we shift the indices up by 1. So we look at sk plus 2. This is root 1 plus sk plus 1. Now we've made an assumption that this guy is bigger than SK. Which is nothing but SK plus 1. Right. So indeed, the, the logic was not any different than what we did here. OK, so great. SK plus 2 is bigger than or equal to SK plus 1. And therefore, we're going to say Sn plus 1 is bigger than or equal to Sn for all n by induction. And we have a monotonic sequence. And we have a bounded sequence, right? Now, we know in general bounded sequences don't have to converge. They can bounce around, oscillate. But we have a bounded sequence that's going in one way only. It's only going up. Uh, so that's all we need, right? So I did not have to have a simple formula for my Sn. I did not have to be able to guess what the limit was in this case. Uh, and that's important because, again, if I'm doing the numerics using Newton's method to solve something, I don't a priori know what the value is of the limit, right? If I knew that, I wouldn't be using Newton's method. 
Um, so here, I did not need to know the limit. You could work out what the limit is in this case, but you don't need it to prove convergence. And we've done enough here to prove convergence. Any questions on this result or this example? OK, then sometimes we have sequences that may not converge. But what we may be interested in is some sort of generalization of least upper bound or greatest lower bound. But again, where we say, but I don't really care what happens for small values of n. Right? This thing might bounce wildly high at the beginning. But what's sort of a least upper bound in, in the limit in some sense? right? Ignoring what happens at the beginning. What's the greatest lower bound in the limit when n gets large? So this um, gives you a concept, a generalization of the supremum called the limit superior. So I'm going to first write down the definition, which looks a little bit technical. And, and then we're going to uh, draw a picture and try to figure out what this means. Okay. So this, I'm going to say if Sn is bounded above, Okay, and does not diverge to minus infinity. Okay, so what I'm saying is I'm not going to try to come up with an upper bound, at least upper bound in the limit if this thing is just shooting down to minus infinity. Okay, then I'm going to claim there exists some number that I'm going to call s bar. which we call the limit superior. And this number has two important properties. OK, again, I'm going to write them down, and they look technical. And then we'll try to figure out what they mean, that they're reasonable. So two things. One is that for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists some n star such that uh, if n is bigger than n star, okay, then Sn is less than s bar plus epsilon. OK, so that looks technical. We'll draw the picture in a minute. But what that's just saying is that s bar is somehow acting as an upper bound in the limit. Right? When n is big enough, Sn wants to stay less than s bar, or at least not exceed it by too much. OK, and then there's a second part. So that's the part where we say this thing acts like an upper bound in some sense. And then we also need the part where it says this actually acts like a least upper bound in some sense. So this is going to say for all natural numbers, we can find some n beyond it. Just one is enough, okay? such that Sn is bigger than S bar minus epsilon. Okay, this is the part that's going to say, actually, s bar acts like a least upper bound. Sn c keeps coming up close to it. Okay, and we're going to write this. n star isn't unique. Uh, n star does not have to be unique. You just have to find one n star. But any n beyond that point, it's got to work. So we're going to write it like this. We're going to write it as s bar is the lim soup as n goes to infinity of Sn. Um, or sometimes some books will write the limit over bar as n goes to infinity of Sn. I can't remember if your book does this or not. I think this maybe is more standard. 
So what's going on here? I'm going to try to draw a sequence. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so this, okay, this is meant to illustrate a general sequence, which I've put a little structure into it just to make it easier to extract the piece of information that we want. Um, but this works really generally. So what I have is a sequence that is bounded above, right? It doesn't diverge to minus infinity. So it, I'm not saying it's bounded below. These points could get arbitrarily low. But what I'm saying is the limit of this sequence is not minus infinity, because even though it gets really low, it bounces back up again, okay? So bounded above. Not necessarily bounded below, it might be, it might not be, but we don't have a limit going down to minus infinity. So that's where we're starting. Okay, now I want to say, what is the upper bound of this thing, the least upper bound of this thing in the limit? Well, okay, this is, this point probably is the upper bound right here, the actual supremum of all of these points. But again, I don't care what happens when n equals 1, I care what happens when n is large. When n is large, it looks like we have some points that are sort of approaching this value here, a little bit lower. So maybe I'm going to call this my candidate for s bar, this value right here. Okay, so is, this is not an upper bound on the sequence, right? We have points, we have lots of points, infinitely many maybe, that are above this value. It's not an upper bound, but somehow it becomes an upper bound in the limit. Right? Okay, these things are allowed to get above it, but whatever tolerance we pick, they're not allowed to get above it by more than that tolerance. And the limit, as n goes to infinity, these things are going to either touch this line or be below this line. That's what I mean by a limit superior. Okay, so now I'm going to pick an epsilon. Uh, and I want to do exactly that. I'm going to say, again, S bar does not have to be an upper bound for the sequence. The sequence is allowed to jump above it. It's even allowed to jump well above it initially. But eventually, it should settle down and not jump above it by more than this tolerance epsilon. And I can make epsilon as small as I like. So if I pick this to be my epsilon, I'm going to say, eventually, Maybe at this point, maybe this becomes my Sn star. Once I'm beyond this point, let me do a different marker. Once I'm beyond this point, the sequence always stays below this line. So this is. This value here is s bar plus epsilon. Okay, and no matter how small epsilon is, I can make s bar plus epsilon an upper bound, an actual upper bound, as long as I start late enough. So that's what I'm saying, right? No matter how tiny epsilon is, s bar plus epsilon acts as an upper bound eventually, right? We might be very close to the upper bound like we are here. We might be well below it, but it certainly is an upper bound. So that's part one of this, right? That's the part that says s bar somehow acts as an upper bound in the limit. Okay, then the second thing is that we want s bar to act as a least upper bound, right? When we talked about the supremum, we said there's lots of different upper bounds we could have. Which one is the tightest, right? I could have an upper bound that's way up there, on the, sitting on the projector or something. That's an upper bound, but it's clearly not a least upper bound, right? Um, I could have, take this value and say this is an upper bound, which it is, this first value. But somehow, again, I don't care what happens at n equals 1. I care what happens in the limit. And in the limit, we're getting below that point. Okay, so what's the second thing that it says? It says that if this is going to be a least upper bound in the limit, then no matter how far along I am, we might drop well below that value, but at some point we have to come back up close to this value again, right? 
Um, if we never get close to this value, then it's really not acting like our least upper bound. We should shift it down. So this is going to be the other point. Again, we say, uh, let's pick an epsilon. Maybe I'll pick, this is my epsilon. Doesn't matter too much. Uh, maybe I'll pick a smaller epsilon, actually. Doesn't really matter. OK, and again, I'm going to draw this line. And then I'm going to pick any value, any value I like. Maybe I decide to pick this value as my SM. I could pick any value that I like. OK, and what we're saying is that OK, this value happens to be well below this dotted line. But again, the sequence has to come back up and get close to this dotted line. It has to get above this dotted line. So I have to be able to find a value of n somewhere. Uh, maybe I'll pick this one, which is bigger than my lower dotted line. Right. Sometimes these back values might come below it and approach it from below. They can do that too. That's fine. But as long as I have something, I can always find another value above this dotted line. I say, actually, I want to go farther than this. I will always be able to find another value above this dotted line. No matter how far out I want to look, I can do it. Right? Because this in the limit, this stays as a least tight upper bound. We keep coming close to this dotted line again. Yes? There's also a limit inferior, yes. So you can define, yeah. So um, in this case, in this case we wouldn't have a limit. So limit inferior is going to look like our greatest lower bound in the limit, right? Now here, if we're looking for lower bound, this might be going off to minus infinity, so we might not have one, right? So the things are going to be reversed when we write that. Then we're going to care that the sequence is bounded below and doesn't go off to positive infinity. So it will be the same picture, but we just have to flip it on its head. Yes? So in the precondition where we say that the sequence does not diverge to minus infinity, yes. it's a, it, that, that means that it can't exclusively, like it, an oscillatory function that goes down to minus infinity right. sometimes does not diverge to minus infinity. Right. So this sequence here, this again, this might have points that go down through the center of the Earth to China and beyond, right? and go off to minus infinity. But it doesn't only do that. Every, no matter how low it goes it afterwards, it's going to jump back up. And it's going to, no matter how low it goes, sometime later, it's going to jump back up above this green line. So if we're thinking of like the absolute value of a sine curve yeah. times an exponential yeah. and like negative, so it goes down as far as you want, yeah. but it goes back up to zero, yes. that has a limit superior. That would still have a limit superior, exactly. So when I say bounded, I'm only bounding it above. All I'm saying is it can go as low as it wants, as long as it keeps coming back up. Yes? Also, in that second condition, part B, yes. um, if we were to switch for all m to be there exists in m, and then for some m to for all m, so we'd like switch the qualifiers, um, that becomes the definition of the limit. Uh, then we become the definition of the limit, yes. So this is different than the definition of the limit. And again, so I've drawn this picture where we don't have a limit. Right. right. So, so yeah, I'm not saying that all values of n are going to stay above this dotted line. I'm just going to say, I'm just saying that we can always find some value that comes above the dotted line. So when we, when we write this definition, we're effectively breaking the limit into the two halves of epsilon above and below, and then we switch one of the halves to all halves dropping out. Essentially, that's what we do, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is not, there's pieces of this that look very similar to the limit, but it's not a limit. And we're going to do examples. Are there any other questions on the definition or the picture? It's, it's technical. It takes a little while to get your head around it, and that's okay. So let me do this example. 
uh, Sn is minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n. And I'm going to draw some, a picture of some of the values just so we get some intuition into what this is doing. Okay, so I'm going to call this, this is 0. And if I put in n equals 1, uh, this is what I get. Okay, we'll mark this as 1. And let's mark this as minus 1. Okay, then I plug in n equals 2, and I get 1 plus a half. So S2 is going to go here. Okay, S3, I'm going to get minus 1 plus a third, so minus 2 thirds. So S3 is going to go here. S4 is 1 plus a quarter, so S4 goes here. S5 minus 1 plus a fifth, that's minus 4 fifths, so S5 goes here. Uh, S6 is going to go here. S7 is going to go here, and so on. All right, this is not a conversion sequence, right? And I mean, you know that. You can look at that and see that that's true. But um, it is a bounded sequence. In this case, it's bounded from above and from below. So we should expect to be able to get a limit superior and a limit inferior. Um, so my first question is, what is the limit superior? OK, you say 1. You said 1 half. You said what? You said S2. Joe, you think 1? Maybe 2 or S2? So let's keep in mind one thing. I do not care what the first few values do. I care what happens in the limit. What is going to act as an upper bound in the limit? That means I don't really care about S2. I care about larger values of that than this. I don't even really care about S4. I care about larger values than this, right? And let me ask you again, what is the limit superior? Zero is the limit superior, right? So zero is not an, clearly not an upper bound on this sequence, right? But somehow in the limit, as n gets large enough, these things are going to try to stay close to zero or stay much less than zero, right? They're in the limit. They don't want to get bigger than zero. Yeah. Wouldn't S six be seven six? Uh, I'm. Yeah. Uh, I move this value. Yeah. Okay, so what was this? This should be S1, 1 plus 2. Thank you. S1, S1 is 0. Yeah. All right, let's move this. S1 is right. S1 is right. Yeah, these should be, shif these should be shifted. S2, S4, S6. There we go. Thank you. That's better. Okay, so, so what's the limit superior? 1. The limit superior is 1, yes. Right, which again is not, still not an upper bound, right? These things are well above it, but in the limit, they're trying to get either close to this or less than this. So our hypothesis, our guess is that the limit superior is equal to 1. And what would you guess if we were going to write down the limit inferior? We'd guess it would be negative 1, which is actually a legitimate lower bound in this case, right? But again, what's that? So won't the numbers be going below um, In this case, they don't go below negative 1. Uh, they, they can. They're allowed to. In, the, in this case, they don't. But as n gets large, right, again, as n gets large, either these numbers get arbitrarily close to minus 1 which we can be arbitrarily close on either direction, or they stay above it. So when n is odd, when n is odd it gets close to a negative 1, and <coughs> it gets close, close or close to the 1. That's what's happening in this case. There's an odd even distinction. The right. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter whether coming, getting close from above or from below. It just matters that we're getting close or staying below. Or we're getting close or staying above. OK? so. Let's try to uh, at least check this one. So let's choose an epsilon greater than 0. 
Okay, so part A said that we want to show that we can force the sequence to stay less than 1 plus epsilon. So can we force Sn to be less than 1 plus epsilon? OK, so we know which direction we want the inequality to be going. We know this has to hold for all n that are big enough. So let's look at Sn. Sn is minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n. And this is certainly less than 1 plus 1 over n. And indeed, we can make this less than 1 plus epsilon, right? As long as we take n big enough. So as long as n is bigger than 1 over epsilon, and this can become my n star. Right, so part A checks out. Part A says that indeed 1 looks like an upper bound in the limit, right? It, it, as n gets large, Sn wants to stay less than 1. Okay, it might climb a teeny bit above it. But, but not, not by very much. It's trying to get close to 1 or stay definitely less than that. And we can do that as long as we take n big enough. So part A checks out. OK, part B. This time, we have our epsilon, and we also get to pick an m, right? Any m that you like, as big as that you like. And the sequence, it might, you know, it may be here, it may be way far away from 1. But we need to show that we're going to get back up close to 1 again. So part b, we choose any, any m. And we need to find an n. Such that, okay, such that we come up here, right? Such that Sn is bigger than 1 minus epsilon. And again, we don't have to show this works for all n, because we know once we get up there, we're going to bounce down here again. We just need to find one n that makes it work. So what's a good choice of n, for example? Sure, 2n would be a, a, a good choice, right? We, we know we should be picking something that is even, right? We know we should pick something even. So let's try n equals 2m, which is certainly bigger than m. Then we say Sn is going to be minus 1 to the 2m plus 1 over 2m. This is 1 plus 1 over 2m. Right now we know we're in the regime where we're getting close to 1, which is bigger than 1, which is indeed bigger than 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so part. Part B ch checks out, and that's it. That then says, now we know that the limit superior of this sequence of Sn is equal to 1. Questions on this example? 
Um, it doesn't have to have something to the n power. You, know. you can have very general sequences. And again, the sequences that you might be working with in real life might be coming from doing some kind of numerical approximation scheme. Um, I mean, that's where I would typically see these. And you're trying to show that there's a limit superior. You have something bounded. So you can show there's a limit superior, and then you want to learn some properties of about it, and hopefully that it's something useful to you. So a lot of times it's not so, like symbolically expressed. So a lot of times it won't be symbolically expressed. Okay, I'm going to let me write out the precise definition of the limit inferior um, so you have it. Right, the limit inferior just turns this on its head. And it's a good exercise. It would be a great exercise for you to work through this problem and show that the limit inferior is minus one. Um, but let me just write it down. If S n is bounded below and does not diverge to positive infinity, okay, then. There exists some unique value, which we'll call S underline. This is the limit inferior. Okay, such that for all epsilon greater than zero, we have two things. So again, one is that this thing wants to act like a lower bound in the limit. So there exists some n star such that if n is bigger than n star, okay, then again, this wants to act like a lower bound. That means Sn has a tendency to want to be bigger than S underline. It might not quite be bigger than S underline, but as long as we subtract off a little tolerance, it will be. Okay, so again, this is the line that says S lower bar is trying to act like a lower bound in the limit. For large values of n, Sn wants to stay above this value. And part b, again, you give me any value, I can find some other value beyond it, such that. And again, we were saying, not only is this a lower bound in the limit, it's the greatest lower bound. right? So my sequence either wants to be close to this value or well above it. And if it's well above it, it's going to come back down close to it again. So Sn is less than S bar plus epsilon. Okay, and then we'll write lim inf. Okay, and then just as a comment, you've sort of already pointed out, right, that this definition comes with half the definition of the limit and not the other half. If your limit inferior and your limit superior happen to be the same, you've got a, a, an actual limit, right? Um, because then your least upper bound, your greatest lower bound are the same thing. So this is a theorem that uh, s bar equals s bar uh, if and only if the limit as n goes to infinity of s n is also equal to these things. Okay, and that's a again a sh short proof. I'm just saying that. Half the defi each of these gives you half the definition of the limit. You put it together and you get the full definition of the limit. Okay, so I'll leave you there. Um, we're going to talk more about sequences next week.